What up, though? Welcome to Jalen TV and a special exclusive. Mahmoud Abdul Raouf. You see the hoodie right now. Stan comes out on Showtime, February 3rd. It's going to be the documentary of the year. Here's a gentleman that gave so much to the game, still gives us so much as a humanitarian, as one of the most knowledgeable people that I've ever encountered, and one of the most pure souls that you could ever meet. It is my honor to welcome you, Mahmoud Abdul Raouf, to the show. Welcome, my brother. Thank you for having me, man. The honor is mine. So I want to ask you about playing basketball in high school. Can you recall some of your favorite games and some of your favorite moments? Yeah, um, man, high school was a wonderful time for me. I can remember going to Lake Charles, Louisiana, and they had a all American there went to, I think, McDonald's. I can't remember. I think his name is Demetrius. And we were playing in their, uh, obviously in their gym. And it was a championship game. And I didn't know that they were betting uh, in, uh, in the stands because I came down and I was hitting some threes. And I ended up hitting like nine in a row. Mm. I ended up with like, I think that game, 55. And uh, I definitely remember that tournament. I remember going to K Kissimmee, Florida, Kissimmee, Florida. And I think I still hold the record at the most points scored in that tournament. Mm. I remember going to, I think, uh, Tallahassee. I think I still hold the record in that tournament. Wow. So it was, it was some great moments for me, man, uh, just in high school, uh, playing uh, and competing. It was, it was just it – was, it was a great era to play basketball. So you're black. You grew up poor. You grew up in a single parent household mm -hmm. and you had Tourette's syndrome. Mm -hmm. For those of us that have never been to your hometown, it ain't the most welcoming and diverse place mm -hmm. for people that look like us. Mm -hmm. So how did you and your family navigate a lot of the racial challenges that took place when you were growing up in your hometown? Man, that's a great question. Uh, as as far as my family's concerned, man, they just they so many of us are taught to keep our mouth shut and just play the game, mm. right? Don't ruffle any feathers, mm. and that was pretty much my family. Uh, they go to work, they stay to themselves, you know, in the in the in, in their environment. They wouldn't necessarily venture off into white areas, mm. uh, and so as a young boy, you grow up. Unfortunately, you grow up with this same mentality, right? You're just trying to play the game, you know, be silent, even though you know that there are things that don't, that are not right, don't make sense to you. So that's how they were able to get through it. For me also, man, I just, my life was basketball. I'm waking up, you know, other than going to school or whatever, I stayed on the basketball court. So that kept me out of a lot of trouble, you know, that, a, a lot of things other children could have been getting into. And also what it did was because now I'm in a sense a piece of meat, right? Mm -hmm. that's, that's value. Mm -hmm. So so he can do something, we can use him. And so that kind of kept me a little bit during the season fed on the AAU team, getting the shoe here, <laughs> getting a little McDonald's here <laughs> that you couldn't get from your mama because we can't, you know, we can't afford it like that. And for those that don't know, when I grew up, a tale of not being a black person in the wrong place at the wrong time was the unfortunate killing of Emmett Till for mm -hmm. allegedly winking or whistling at a white woman. So you alluded to your family made sure that you knew and they knew not to venture off in the wrong area at the wrong time. What would happen if that took place? Oh, anything. I mean, just like you said, man, uh, you know, we were taught being before the uh, the street lights come on. Mm. And uh, there were reasons because of that, you know. Uh, 
than these crazy people in the world. And Mississippi is still probably considered one of the worst mm -hmm. in terms of the South. I mean, it's so bad. I mean, look, man, they still had a law or a policy. I almost didn't go to the Nike camp mm. because if it wasn't for Dr. Dunn, somebody, because I already missed the prestigious camp, I think in South Carolina, I forget the, what the name of it was there because they were hiding my letters. They wanted me to go to Mississippi school. Oh. And then it got back to me. And by then I had such a name. So I felt like I can go and challenge you more. Plus, I'm pissed off now because, man, you mess with my livelihood. Mm. Now all bets are off. And the state of Mississippi said that even though Nike was inviting me, they were going to pay, pay my way, everything, flight. You know how they do it. Yep. If I were to accept that offer, I would be ineligible to play high school basketball. Wow. The, I, had to, I had to pay it for it myself. My mom didn't have that money. Dr. Dunn ended up putting money in her account. Nobody else could pay it. Wow. Put money in her account for me to go to Nike camp. Then they told me once I went to camp, I can't be, bring back paraphernalia. And I just paid my way. What? Oh, yeah. That's why I'm still bitter when it comes to that state. Because I, not just because, okay, I caught it. But how many souls did y'all mess up all of those years before me? that they didn't know. So yes, it's, it's, so it's a lot. Yeah. <laughs> and what ends up happening for athletes, you just uh, illuminated many things is how, because of our tech, because of our talent, we get accepted in the certain rooms, in the certain crowds and are afforded certain opportunities. What was it like for you finding out I'm so very talented but yet y'all literally trying to hide the fact that I'm getting letters nationally to try to funnel me to a school in my home state. How did I feel? Yes. Man, I was furious. I, I went into Coach Coach Jenkins at the time for the longest was the winningest coach in the state of Mississippi. You know, at championship, he was well-respected. But, man, again... I was a quiet dude. I was, in a sense, non-confrontational because that's the way you were conditioned. Mm -hmm. But when that happened, man, I was so furious. Man, I said, all bets are off. Man, I, don't, I don't give a who, who you are. Mm -hmm. So I went and had a meeting with him in his office. And I, I let him know that I was aware of what was going on. Wow. And that I, was, I let him know that I was aware also that I had a, a letter from Nike camp. And I said to him, I said, and I told him you were wrong. And, and I said, that's treacherous and diabolic and all those things. I said, but I'm not coming in this office to seek your permission. I'm coming to tell you I'm going to the Nike camp. Mm. You know, and I was, man, I was feared. He And he ended up saying to me at the time, he said, well, you can get more, just as much, if not more notoriety in the state. Of, I said, man, you got to be kidding me. And mm. this was probably my first time legitimately having a confrontation with an authority figure who happened mm. to be white and an elder, you know, because now you, I'm pissed off now. And what mm -hmm. you did was absolutely wrong. You messing with my livelihood and the mm. possibility of making money for my family and so on and so forth. And he, I said, man, no way in the world that I'm gonna have that type of, uh, I mean, you got, you got 110 of the top players in the nation, colleges from all over the country. You, you must be, no, I said, I'm going. And that's, that's that. And, and so, yeah, so it, it was, uh, I was man, furious. I'm still furious when I think of it. <laughs> you should be, and, and rightfully so. Do you remember some of the other top players that were at the Nike camp, that were at the top camps when you were in high school? Yeah, you had Lafonso Ellis. I mean, you had uh, Lonzo Mourning. Uh, you had, well, he, I mean, he was, he didn't really prosper in uh What's his name? You had like, uh, what's his name? King, Rice King. You had uh, Kenny Anderson came one year. You had uh, uh, Derek Martin, right? Uh, um, Sean Kemp, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. All of those guys, yeah. man. Uh, Stanley Roberts, mm -hmm. uh, Christian Leitner. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, you know, there's just a host. I mean, a host of them, man, coming through that. Yeah. And that's always an amazing question to hear an answer from the top player of a class 
because so many times people feel like they're part of the best class. And you just named what I consider one of the greatest classes of all time. Mm. And this led for you to sign with Dale Brown and go to LSU. So how did you go from being the player whose letters were getting hidden to ending up at LSU? Man, I started getting, I, I had them to redirect all of my mail to me, to my house. So I started getting everything pretty much then. And man, I know that times have changed, but even then people were getting paid, but it had to be under, under the table. And I wanted to get paid too. And I should, we all should have got paid back then. Yep. <laughs> uh, however, I was so scared because Ella, Ella, well, I was scared period. Cause I didn't want my eligibility, them to find out. And then my eligibility is messed up. Correct. Because I'm banking on this. This is all in my mind, all I got. Right. So with LSU, man, I was, I was told through Dr. Dunn, other teams were offering me stuff. But actually, LSU came in. And everything I tell you, I don't mince my words. They came in. They said, we got fair serving. Everybody else said, when you come here, you're going to play. Da, 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 da. They said, we got fair serving. He was a McDonald's All-American. He was last year at college. He was a freshman, uh, all, All-American. You will be playing with him and or whatever. He said, y'all going to compete. They never offered me anything. Mm -hmm. And I, what I liked about it was they said, if you got what it takes, you're going to play. I always hated unhealthy favoritism. Mm -hmm. I felt if it's a favorite, let it be earned. Correct. And that's the thing that kind of threw me off. Teams would say, hey, you're going to come. I said, how do you, how you know, man, what tomorrow going to bring? We don't even know what the next minute going to bring. And right. he promised. But when they didn't promise me that, I was kind of old school, man. I just shook their hand. I said, I can't make it public right now. Mm -hmm. I'm going to come to LSU. Because I felt that that approach, they were going to be fair. Correct. And that's 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 the reason I went. And I wanted to go further. I didn't want right. to be that close to home. Mm. You know what I mean? But it was right. like, you know what, man? It's just something. And then Coach Cars, the assistant, we talked. But probably, man, he, he said he's got it. Law, we talked for hours, hundreds and hundreds of hours. 97% wow. of our calls had nothing to do with basketball. Mm. And that's that's what did it for me. And so not only did you sign your letter of intent ultimately, but you went to LSU and you turned college basketball out in a way that we hadn't seen. The kind of dazzling ball handling exploits, the big numbers, shooting with range, shooting with accuracy. Describe what your freshman year was like for you at LSU. Close to phenomenal, man. Uh, I mean, I remember Kent Lowe, the media guy, asked me, what do you want your career to say for itself when you're through with LSU? I said, man, if I can average 13 points, seven assists. <laughs> In the and first I, 10 I, minutes I, of the I, game? <laughs> I, I meant it, but, but I was also taught this early. You can't always tell people your major, major goals. Preach. Sometimes they'll try, they'll call you arrogant or foolish, right? Try to talk you out of it. Mm -hmm. I wanted to dominate, but mm -hmm. I wasn't going to tell. And first game, it was like 12, 13 points, six, seven assists. Mm -hmm. Second game, 21. And after that game, I noticed something, man, but I was kind of superstitious. But I'm like, I don't want to say nothing. I don't want to mess nothing up. But man, this seemed like it's easy. Like, I'm mm -hmm. doing the same stuff I've been doing in elementary, junior, mm -hmm. same moves. And, uh -huh. and then that's when Dale Brown stopped me. He said, we need you to score more. I said, I'll try. And then the third game was 48. Mm -hmm. I think it was 30-something after that. Then there was a 53 in Florida. Mm -hmm. And I'm kind of thinking, you know how it is, man. You know when you start hitting, there's a there's more of a – not as a target on your back. Yes. Worst thing you, gonna, you can do is go to sleep. No, I got to get in the gym and I got to work harder because now there's going to be double teams, triple teams. Yeah. Yep. And you want to be ready for them. And so that was my whole year. And the whole time I'm thinking, okay, this is too good to be true. Something's going to happen. They're going to devise this and this to try to shut me down. But also I'm training for that not to happen. Correct. But this is what's going on in my mind. And it's a constant tug of war that, that's taking place, man. But it was, it was, I mean, you know, Sports Illustrated, Street and Smith, Cover Street. I'm like, wow. Wow. Amazing. And also, 
you were one of the first players that broke the chains of positionless basketball for somebody your height and somebody that played guard. Now it's normal for the primary ball handler to express himself whatever his skill is. If you could be a high scorer, Steph Curry, John Morant, that Luka Doncic, that's accepted. But when you play and quote unquote play point guard, a lot of people didn't like that. Mm -hmm. So can you describe what it was like playing that style and scoring 53s and 40s as a freshman playing what they considered the traditional point guard position? You're in prison. As simple as that, you know, you, you, you handcuffing players. I've always, even when I was younger, man, I always, but, but of course you, you got authority, people are stuck in their ways, but like what we see now in basketball, big men handling the rock, shooting, passing, posting guards doing the, you know, sometimes posting up. Mm -hmm. That's the way basket basketball is such the more versatile you are, the more valuable you are. I always disagree with the big man should only just play. What if we need him to dribble the ball? What if he? What if you got a, a big dude, 220 mm -hmm. pounds, but he's playing against a 300 and something pound Shaq, but yet he's got footwork. You're going to keep him on the post and you're going to say, oh, Shaq, you got me here. We're going to double Shaq, but now I'm going to bring Shaq out to the top. Pop, pop, pop. I'm going to do a KD on him. He ain't going to be able to stop me because uh -huh. you – but but if you just used to being on the block, uh -huh. you don't have those skills. And so what you, I've always, so I felt in prison. You know what I mean? I'm like, felt, I mean, look, same with you. Yep. You feel like, darn, man, just leave me alone. I'm a, right. I'm going to play. I'm going to pass the ball. But I tell people, and, and most of us are this way that made to lead, and some of us even more, like, you feel like you can take 30 shots, 40 shots, and they'll be good shots. Correct. But you can't. Because the way it looks, it looks like you're selfish. So you got to pass it. But it's like, man, God, I could have took that. I took that shot right there. Because you didn't play so much. But you yeah. don't because, you know, you got to keep a balance. So that's the way I felt. I'm like, man, <laughs> you know. Yeah. And you broke a lot of barriers for people that came behind you. And I was one of those who eventually became a point guard, so to speak that wanted to play multiple positions, but that was frowned upon. And like you, I played with great big men that went on to play um, at a high level. So what was it like in college for you, playing with Shaq and Stanley and people feeling like he should be giving them the ball <laughs> and they feel like he should be giving me the ball and Nurturing those dynamics. Man, it's, it's tough because, you know, when people are not in practice and, and they don't they don't know the nuances and the dynamics, it's easy to look at height and all of that. And But at that time, uh, Shaq wasn't as skillful as he became later on. Mm -hmm. You know, he could bring the ball up and all of that. He was, he was strong. Now, Stanley was more skillful. But mm -hmm. even with Stanley, Stanley would check out a whole mm -hmm. lot. Mm -hmm. Stanley, he give you one good game or one good practice. He might miss about two, three. You know, he, mm -hmm. he'll tell you, he's going to take a vacation. So you got to make choices. Sometimes, you know, it's like, well, I believe it's not, it's not selfish, but it kind of is. It's a healthy selfishness, I guess. It's mm -hmm. like, well, I trust myself in this scenario more than you right now. We trying mm -hmm. to win. Correct. Right. And so it's, but it's hard. It's, it's to be able to manage people and to mm -hmm. still, for them to set the right picks and to play and and you still be brotherly, man. It's, it, and especially headstrong as Shaquille. Shaquille was a beast in terms of he came in. He had some foresight, man. He he said to and Broussard Hall one day, he's I'm going to be the first player to have an $80 million contract. That's before, mm -hmm. well before. Wow. And he's way, made way more since then. Right. But right. He, he worked hard, man. He was a hard worker. And I think it was his work hard, his confidence in himself, that 
that definitely, because Stanley, if Stanley would have had that by far, Stanley mm -hmm. was way more skillful, but he didn't have to work at it. But yeah, it was it was nice to come to practice every day, man, with those guys. And they're competing. They're trying to block your shot. <laughs> you know what I mean? And, and so that stuff helps, especially when you get to that, another le that next level. Absolutely. And it's just refreshing for me to hear you guys' goals get exceeded. You saying that you hope to average 13 and you will get that in three minutes of a game. And Shaq saying that he hoped to eight, make $80 million and he's probably making that as a retired player yeah and so what was it like for you to watch a young Shaq as you mentioned all of the skills that he had continue to grow as a player on and off the floor well man it was it was beautiful to watch but I wasn't surprised like even to see him on television and, and mm -hmm. as as jovial and humorous mm -hmm. and, and and sometimes silly as he is he was that was his personality as you <laughs> always trying to make people laugh, but also trying to, you know, give his time and give to people, you know, and, 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 and so he was that way. And he was a, he, he had major confidence in himself, mm -hmm. you know, and believed in himself and he worked. Mm -hmm. So I wasn't surprised to see the level of success he, he, uh, he achieved on all of those levels. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he came from a family man that, you know, his 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 his, his father, stepfather's uh, field, and his mother, mm -hmm. the discipline that they instilled in him, the work ethic, you know, the being, you know, polite and all of that, man, that stuff, that stuff pays dividends. It does. You know, and it, it, really it goes does. a long way. So I, I wasn't surprised, but it was. It's it's all for me, man. I don't care what my condition is. I never allow my condition, whether great or not so great to cause me to develop some type of animosity or envy or jealousy. I love to see people make it. Mm -hmm. I mean, genuinely love it mm -hmm. because you know everything happens for a reason. So I'm just, I'm just, Hey man, I wasn't surprised and enjoyed watching him and still he's, he's doing his thing. So and he gives back. Yes, he does. And, and as you transition from a collegiate player to a professional player, you did something that a few athletes before you did as it relates to changing their name. Mm -hmm. Muhammad Ali, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, there's so many athletes and they got criticized and ostracized for it. Mm -hmm. For me, Muhammad Ali never truly got his due right. from mainstream media because of that. Mm -hmm. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, who LeBron James is about to pass right now on the scoring list, never truly got his due partly because of that. Mm -hmm. When you decided to change your name to Mahmoud Abdul Raouf, what changes did you see in how you were perceived and how you were covered as an athlete and as a person? Well, there's definitely changes. Uh, there, were, there were people, first of all, trying to discourage you away from it. And, and then after that, initially, it was more like, okay, he's a Muslim. That's just like saying nowadays somebody's a Christian. How mm -hmm. many people wear their Christianity and Islam on their sleeve, right? Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of people, it's just because they what they grew up doing. And I think what, what they were doing was they were seeing, and you were there, mm -hmm. I think they were saying, let's see how serious he's going to take it. Mm -hmm. But now when I'm pr praying in the locker room, uh -huh. in, in the equipment room before before coming out and I'm doing all this and I'm praying before this and I'm having different type of discussions now. I'm meeting mm -hmm. with people in my room. So hold on, he's taking this thing serious. Correct. And so that's when you begin to see the shift because there's a country club. Correct. Right in the league. People do things and they feel sometimes, I guess, well, if he ain't a part of what we're doing, going out doing this, then he gonna, he gonna be a snitch in the tattletale. Man, I'm <laughs> in my own world, man. I'm doing my thing. Yep. I ain't studying all of that right there. And so you hear it, you hear it in the conversations, you see it in the facial expression. And I always try to pride myself. Yeah, I was passionate. Anytime you learn something in the beginning, you gung ho, man. You want to share it. You want to, you yep. want to get into debates because that's a part of learning. But then I had to learn, say, hold on, man, let me, you know, let me calm down, let me create more of a balance. 
because you can scare people away too. You can come right. too hard. But I noticed the shift, man. And uh, but that's that's what happens with us individually. Anytime we begin to educate ourselves, right? There's going to be a shift in your behavior. Your your thinking influences your behavior. Your behavior forms your character. Your character determines your fate. And it's also going to affect people around you because some of those people, any change is uncomfortable, mm-hmm. right? And it's going to make them feel uncomfortable. It's like, okay, because sometimes we feel what we don't know. Mm-hmm. I understood that, man. Uh, you know, and it, and it is what it is. But I wouldn't change. I wouldn't change a thing. And that religion led to you standing, so to speak, as you guys see my hoodie, February 3rd, the Showtime documentary featuring my brother, Mahmoud Abdul Raouf, will be out. Make sure you check this. It was fascinating for me because, as you mentioned, I was on your team, and I got a chance to intimately spend time with you. So I knew that that wasn't phony. Like, I did see you in the locker room. I did see you at the hotel. I did see you changing your meals. I did see all of this. So I personally was frustrated when you decided to take your peaceful stand Mm -hmm. during the national anthem. A lot of people didn't realize you had been doing that for weeks, either staying in the locker room during the national anthem or peacefully handling it the way that you chose. Mm -hmm. So can you describe the dynamics of when you decided to either be in the locker room during the national anthem or do your peaceful protest during it? Actually, it was like months the previous year uh, and then rolling into the next year. And I was mostly everything I did was on the court. There was only a few occasions when, you know, you got to go to the restroom sometimes before the game. <laughs> Right. That I'm in the bathroom, but they keep saying, well, bathroom. But no, it was, I would be on the court, but I'd stretch mm-hmm. during the time. I'd be on the court, and when I was standing, I'd look the other way. Right, That was my way of doing it because, see, I'm still learning. I'm still mm-hmm. processing things. But I knew enough to know that I, I'm not going to stand at attention and honor this. I knew that. And that's when somebody caught wind of it. And that's mm-hmm. when Todd Ely came to me and asked me, Mm-hmm. I said, sure, no problem. I'll talk to anybody because you you know. Yep. We, we man, on the bus, on the plane, we always have a different conversation. Correct. Everybody. And I tell people, I said, look, man, look, don't believe the hype and all of this basket, you know, athletes shut up and dribble and and uh, ignore, brother. You got most of the athletes you cross, yeah, you got ignorance everywhere. You got right. ignorant lawyers. Yeah. You got ignorant <laughs> engineers. But you man. A lot of these athletes are seriously intelligent, man. They can mm-hmm. have, they can hold conversations. Correct. And we would have these conversations. Correct. Whether it's religion, politics, relationships, yes. we're people too. Correct. And, and so, you know, for 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 me, that was. I, I don't know if I'm on, on on the topic, but I'm like. Uh, what, what were we just saying? Man, I lost my train of thought. You were talking um, about you were. St- standing peacefully during the national anthem for months and then it rolled into the next year before really the public paid attention to you doing it. Yeah, yeah. So that's when when it came out, Todd Ely, I said, yeah, sure, I'll talk to him. And then when I talked, before you know it, man, uh, uh, the next day, we're in shoot around. Journalists come up. I'm thinking they're for Shaq. Because mm-hmm. Shaq is in town. Right. Because we ain't never seen, you know, that many at the door <laughs> right. unless it's Jordan or Shaq. Correct. And that's when they came to me. I, I, and they asked me the question. I spoke my conscience. And then that night, I get into the locker room and uh, Jim Gillen said, hey, man, Bernie want to see you. Mm. I go down and say, okay, what's up? He said, NBA call. They want to find you and suspend you. What do you say? I said, I can't do it. I'm not going to do it. He's, and that's when he got me on the phone with a couple of them. And we had a conversation. And they identified themselves as Jewish. He gave me an example. And I said, respectfully, I said, thank you for sharing that. I said, but in this particular case, I said, for one, I'm not Jewish. And in this particular case, that 
that uh, example don't apply to me. I said, so I'm not standing. Do what you got to do. I'm so green, man. I, I've never been suspended in my life, fined in my life. I'm thinking there's going to be an act of legislation, take some days and say, can I go get on my uniform and man, go play? He said, no. I said, I'm fine right now? Mm -hmm. He said, yeah. I said, well, can I go in the stands and support the team? He said, no. Mm -hmm. He said, they don't even want you on the premises. Mm -hmm. I said, okay, no problem. And that's when I went to the locker room. I don't know who was in there at the time. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you or whatever, but because y'all could have been on the court or whatever, but I said whatever to, uh, I, I, I think Dale was in there still. Mm -hmm. And it's what's up, man. I said they, they let me go. They find me, and that's when I went on. <laughs> and for those that don't know, and I'm glad you acknowledge that the intellect that athletes have, and we're not gonna just shut up and dribble. Right. And we stand on the shoulders of giants. One of my favorite pitchers is the Ali Summit, and that had nothing to do with the score of the game with he and Jim Brown and Kareem Abdul-Jabbar and Bill Russell. Mm -hmm. And we've seen people come after you like a Colin Kaepernick do a piece for protest during the national anthem and in theory be blackballed from the NFL. Mm -hmm. But that happened to you. We just talked about a guy that was scoring 50 as a freshman in college. A high draft pick that was an all-star in the dunk contest, in the three-point contest, a face of a franchise. What changed for you after that moment professionally? Uh, you know, my uh, traded to Sacramento. Uh, my minutes began to decrease. Uh, and it, it was obvious to me. At first, you know, I, I was like, nah, nah. I'm going to be, cause I'm, profe I'm going to be professional. I'm going to play. I'm going to do this. Mm -hmm. And we're going to, we're going to be able to take care of business. But then I started to see the shift in terms of, and then certain things that were said during that time, some people caught the head coach saying some stuff about not playing me at certain times for certain mm. reasons. And so, okay. And then I'm hearing other coaches, you know, getting back to me saying, Hey man, why are they playing the guy? They're tripping on why. And then usually when I didn't play, uh, journalists would come and say, hey, why aren't you playing? Mm -hmm. But that whole year, man, like, I was like hands off. Not too many people would even come and question me. Right? Mm -hmm. So I started to see patterns. And then they came out with this special, and I'm still top in free throws. Mm -hmm. you know, top free throw shooters in the, in, the, in the league or whatever, and they didn't show me not one time. I, I said, huh. So I, I understood what it was. I said, what they're doing is out of sight, out of mind. You mm -hmm. decrease his minutes. Now you can say, ah, we don't know if you have it anymore. And then it's easier to get rid of me on that than mm -hmm. because there are laws in this country. You can't say we get rid of you because gotcha. it is. Gotcha. So we'll, we'll do this. We'll paint this picture. Mm -hmm. And then he's out of the league. Well, and up it, close and personal, was. I've seen you literally torch and undress some of the greatest players to ever do it. John Stockton is still spinning in circles looking for you because he had no chance against you. I seen it and heard it with my own two. Floor, you were giving me some of those dimes. <laughs> <laughs> no doubt. No question. I'm like, he can't, I'm like, he ain't got a chance against you. But that's the beauty of the league too that I tell people. See, NBA is such that we we all know that it comes back around. Mm -hmm. If this dude hot, they're going to do – and then it's going to open up this. It's going to open up – and, like, if you hot, oh, yep. keep feeding him the ball. No doubt. And that's the beauty of it, man. So I appreciate that. No doubt. And also one of the best games of, of the second season that I played with you was the Bulls had won 72 games that year. Yeah. And at Chicago – yeah. What do you remember about that day playing against Michael and the Bulls? Well, actually, it was in Denver that game. Oh, it was in Denver. Right. Yeah, yeah, so, right. Yeah. No, yeah. The Bulls come to Denver the year that they won 72 games. Yep. A lot of people were paying attention to Jordan being in town, as you mentioned, when Shaq came to town before you thought they were there for them. But they mm -hmm. were also there to see how you were going to respond during the national anthem. And they also were going to see how you were going to then play in that game. So take me back to that day in Denver. 
man, we we had just got news that they were trying Michael Jordan at the point in games before. And he had went to Toronto, and Damon Stoudemire had lit him up. Somebody <laughs> else had lit him up. He's coming to Denver, and I'm like, man, because we know we're human. Mm-hmm. Anything can happen. We can have our we can have an off day, but every time we go on the court, at least you know we we're in kill mode. That's mm-hmm. the intention. Like it ain't personal, yep. but I'm trying to whether win or lose. I want them to say, man, this dude, this is the intention. It don't always happen, but yep. he was the best one out there tonight. So I'm looking at Damon lit him up. Such as, man, I don't want to be the oddball. <laughs> you know what I mean? So it was like hard to, man, I couldn't, you know, hard to sleep, man. It's on your mind. It's like you get extra, extra pump. And I remember when they put him on me, I'm like, man, I'm trying to, I'm trying to get this real quick. Mm. So if they keep him on me, it's going to be a long night. This is my mindset. Or they're going to get him off of it. Mm-hmm. And so they ended up, you know, bickering or whatever between the team. And they, they started switching Harper on me and then Kerr on me. And and so, it, yeah, he – but it's a – I tell people all the time, man, it's – you you're six, what, nine, six, eight? Mm-hmm. You can handle the rock. But if they trying to – this is just business. If they trying <laughs> – if I'm guarding you all day, where they going to take you? To the post. <laughs> they going to give you the ball how many times? As many times as possible. Right, <laughs> because it's a hold on. What, man? This is my position. It's no like doubt. I'm guarding Jordan in his position. Man, give me the rock. So Ooh. we feel the same way. Like, hold on, man. You don't play this position. Ooh. Oh no, I gotta go. No, I gotta no get you off of me. Uh huh. And so we take offense to that. You know what I mean? Yes. And so that's the way my mindset was that night, man. It was just fortunate that you know I got the best of it. You know, he's gotten the best of so many people, but you know, we all get it from time to time. No doubt. He, he was just on that end of it that night. He, you know, he they had to get him up off of me because he just he wasn't that it's a different type of speed mm-hmm. you know, footwork, mm-hmm. you know, that you gotta deal with. You're talking about trying to guard the guys, you know, and then you coming off screens and and one it's it's a different ball game. And yeah. after the game for you, it was a fork in a row about the score of the game and how dominant you were and beating Michael Jordan and torturing the GOAT. Mm -hmm. But then it was the game of life because people wanted to talk to you about your peaceful protest during the national anthem. Did anyone specifically ask you, because I saw Colin Kaepernick be asked this question, did somebody specifically ask you, what about the anthem or what about the flag is offensive to your religion, which is why you're taking the position that you're taking. Oh man, I got I got that question and then some. I got questions about what is it about the, the not just the flag and the religion, but what is it about America X Y and Z? Now, I got those questions religiously, and I, I would tell them depending on who asks in that particular day, because there's so much to say about it. You know, I would tell them that America's it's founded on racism. It's founded on patriarchy. It's founded on capitalism. I said, uh, you know, the history of racism in this country, uh, the global policies that affect millions, the militarization that takes place, you know, uh, the, the the issues that black folks go through day in and day out. But mm-hmm. yet you want us to think that America is so exceptional. And then every time America commits a wrong, then there's this, there's this uh, projection of innocence. Well, you know, we didn't mean it. It wasn't our intention. Right. But anybody else do it, you know. They're lambasted, they're accused as terrorists. So it's just a double standard that exists. And then, you know, whether it's from healthcare, whether it's from living wage, I mean, you name it. And so I said, look, nothing has really changed. I said, if you if you take images of the 50s and 60s in black and white, and you look at all the, the, the law enforcement killing, you look at all the wars since the inception of America, since they since their inception, they've been at war 90 some percent of the time. Mm. Right? The last 20 years, they've been at war about 18 times. Mm-hmm. You know, the, the very act of becoming a citizen, you got to recite a, a national anthem written by a slave owner. And you got to, you got to, you got to, you got to recall so many wars that took place. 
So mm -hmm. militarization and war is part and parcel of becoming a citizen in this country. So I would talk about, so in so many ways, talk about all of that. You know, so this is why I have problems. And so it's like, if you take those images of the 2000s and the 90s mm -hmm. and you put them in black and white, and you mm -hmm. listen to what people are saying, it's the mm -hmm. same conversations we're having mm -hmm. about school choice and or integration. Segre we're more segregated now mm -hmm. than then. So mm -hmm. what has really changed? Why is it I'm supposed to love this place so much? Everybody else has received reparation. Mm -hmm. Black, when we talk about reparation, mm -hmm. boy, you, you start coming up with excuses, mm -hmm. right? But you want to do, you, and, and, and I remember some Randall Robinson said years ago, he said, never in the history have millions of people been deprived of everything except respiratory function, language, mm -hmm. religion, family, daughters, sons, mothers, you know, you name it, and still considered menaces to society. Mm -hmm. I said, so I'm a black man in this country. And on top of that, a Muslim. Mm -hmm. Nothing has, one, you can't outclass racism. I don't care how much money we got, how much position, we still get killed because we black. Mm -hmm. Right, our our education don't necessarily change our status mm -hmm. as black people. So why am I so? So this is kind of like, but of course, when it comes out, <laughs> you know, you right. don't hear all of that. But this yeah. is the message I was sending, and so so if anything, I got I got a serious right and a gripe. And so does so many other people, you know, and we can focus on all the good. But it's so much bad, man, we can't, no. We ain't, see, that's that exceptionalism we're talking about. Mm -hmm. no, we got to deal with all this because, man, y'all leave a trail. Like mm -hmm. the trail of tears? Mm -hmm. Boy, y'all leaving a trail of just destruction and chaos. And this is just me. And I'm always say that as long as that's the case. And we're taught this, that speak the truth even if it's against yourself. Mm. Stand up for justice even if it's against mm. yourself. And that intellect and that courage meant as an entertainer and as an athlete that you will be willing to give it all up because you know what comes with that avalanche, including having the KKK burn your house down. Yeah. yeah. Jalen, uh, one, one thing a lot of people, I think, it's easy for them to look and look and listen to the passion. Yeah, I'm angry. Yeah, I'm bitter. But also, I wouldn't be doing this. And if you look at Muhammad Ali, John Carlos, Tommy Lee, all mm -hmm. of them, this, this comes from a place of love mm -hmm. because you want to see change so much. You don't want to see people abused and taken advantage of. You know it could be better. It's like the saying, justice is what love looks like in public. Mm. You know what I mean? Mm. So it's like, man, this is why this is why people fight for us so much, man, because they have a we're taught that you take one life unjustly. It's as though you've killed all of humanity. But also mm. the flip side, if you save one life, it's mm. as if though so we're always, you know, and so my thing was going through that, you know, as as black people, as Muslims, as people of color, we're taught to walk the earth apologizing. Apologize for you because you're black. Apologize because you're rich. Apologize because you're smart. Apologize because you're dumb. Apologize because I walked past you. Apologize because you did something to me and I had to tell you about it. I said, I'm not going to live my life as an apology. Mm. No more. You know, and, and so it's it, and, and that leads to people wanting to uh, not bring you in and, and, and and give you a job, it leads to people wanting to burn your house down. Mm. You know what I mean? And then what it does too, unfortunately, because you grow up and you spent most of your life honing your skills to play basketball and not learning other things when that's taken away from you, that money starts to dwindle. Mm. And most of us, we don't come from generational wealth. Correct. Most athletes, we're taking care of so many people. And so that money goes fast if we don't have businesses and things taking place. Mm -hmm. And even if we do, if it ain't structured right. So I literally, man, and I didn't, for some of my closest, my closest friends, it was a couple or a few people that knew my condition. I literally went broke, mm -hmm. meaning zilch, didn't have nothing. I'm, I'm, I'm in the house. House foreclosed. I'm going to the gym. I'm praying every day. 
please God, mm. please, I'm sorry, I apologize. I know I did this enough. I just, please get me out of this. Mm. Let's me to maintain my faith. Whatever, I don't care if I die this way, don't let me lose my faith. Don't let me lose my connection with the truth. Don't let me bend. Don't let me compromise. None of that. I'm mm. praying this every day. I'm moving. I don't know. I said, guide my steps. I don't know what I'm going to do. Guide my steps. And so I'm in the house and I'm taking these little, these circle candles in a bag that you buy and I'm burning candles because the house, you know, I'm losing the house. So it's a bigger house. And so I couldn't do them in the front because it's cold. So I had to put the candles in the bathroom and stuff the towels just and sleep on the floor so I can stay warm in the winter. Oh. And look, I'm eating, you know, I'm going back to eating beans and rice. You know what I mean? And I'm like, man, wow, is this what it's come to? <laughs> right? And so, but alhamdulillah, I'm 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 praying, I'm fasting, I'm I'm like, look, man, and and I ain't I ain't out there telling nobody. People be seeing me, hey man, what's up? I'll be walking home from lost my car. Mm. I'm walking home from the gym. Man, what's up? No, man, I what? I'm smiling. I just love to walk, man. I'm exercising. Wow. And I just keep on going. And I do my thing, but my heart was like, man. Yes, that was the toughest, that was one of the toughest periods, man, I ever went through in my life. And then I was able to survive enough to get the pension, but I was penalized because I had to get it early. Mm. <laughs> and mm. I was going through the divorce and then I had to give half or over half of that away mm. so and then what happened the, the speaking engagement start picking up so I couldn't tell people my condition because sometimes if they know you down and out they'll get you undervalued correct. they won't give you what your value is correct you know so I had to still try to you know and, and I'm just big on man I'm gonna hide what I can hide it ain't necessary God you know you know, I just try to fight through it. But that was, when I say the tough man, one of, if not the toughest, man, tough. Wow. I, 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 I admire your courage. I respect you as a human being and as a man and as a brother. I'm so very happy that people are going to get to see your story February 3rd on Showtime. Make sure y'all go check out Stand. It's going to be the documentary of the year. It's going to win multiple awards. But before I let you get out of here, what is something that you hope people see in Stan and take away from it? Faith, conviction, perseverance, never give up. Uh, if I was to put it in just a few words, uh, and just my my... Anytime you tell them a story, if if you can't leave people with more questions and thinking, you know, make mm -hmm. them think, you failed in telling the story. Mm. You know, so if I can leave them with just man to think about things, you know, whether it's faith, whether it's how to navigate through mental illness or uh, uh, Tourette syndrome or whatever they're dealing with, whether it's coming out of poverty, how to navigate through that, whether it's being miseducated and how do you evolve. And, and develop the strength to not only become educate yourself, but also become vocal mm -hmm. in that. Um, all of that, knowing your father, being a you know, single parent, you know, and just all of that, man, the conviction, the faith, the perseverance, uh, the resilience, uh, the love. Mm. Like literally, man, I love people. I love mm. life. I'm, I want to see people make it. Like I'm always saying, man, whatever, I got a saying, man, and I mean it. People say, hey, man, I love you. I love you more. Mm. Hey, man, I want whatever you say for me, may God give you even more. Mm. You know, because I mean it. You know, because it all comes back. It's yes. like the Ubuntu. Yeah. Right? I am because we are. Mm -hmm. You know, we don't do anything, anything on our own. So I'm hoping that they get that, man, and not what has been projected. Oh, this guy, he's, he's he's a radical uh, radical ain't always bad you mm -hmm. look people that invented uh uh medicines or you know mm -hmm. antidotes were ra they were considered radical at one point mm -hmm. <laughs> right? right so not all radicalism is bad but my point is in terms of the negative side of that oh he's radical he's 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 terrorist he's this and that 
No, man, I look, I, I love people enough and I love humanity enough to take the risk of opening my mouth, even if it mm -hmm. hurts me, mm -hmm. you know, and doing so to try to bring about some change, man. You know, that that's just the bottom line. Well, my brother, I love you. <clears throat> love you. I'm grateful for you. And one of the things that I know people are going to take away from this documentary is to have courage mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. say what you feel and stand on what you believe, even if it costs you everything yeah. like it did my brother, Mahmoud Abdul Raouf. Looking forward to seeing you soon, my brother. Like February 3rd, make sure y'all check out Stan on Showtime. Love you, brother. You more. Appreciate it.